Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Manisha, for that really generous introduction and for the uh, invitation to be here tonight. It's really great to be here at the AA. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming, friends, colleagues, uh, and yeah, others for attending. So as this lecture raises the very important topic of new canonical histories, following on from the topic, I decided to use this opportunity to talk about pedagogy and teaching in particular, rather than my own academic research. With the recognition and, and understanding of teaching as both a form of practice and research, yet with a life of its own. So I'd like to start with a question that I think underpins the work that I do in more general terms in teaching and in research, which is to question what it means to engage with the canon of the architect, architecture, architectural, and related to this, to question what it means to think with and through entanglement. And I plan today to discuss this, these questions, which, well, which um, predate this, this invitation, really, by discussing three courses that I've been developing and working on over the course of the last year and a half between London and South Africa. The first that I will talk to is a third year dissertation seminar series that I taught at the Bartlett School of Architecture, Entangled Spaces. The second, an open access curriculum titled Race, Space and Architecture, which I developed with Suzanne Hall. Um, it's great to see her here today at the LSE. And the third and most recent, an emerging history and theory courses, course at the GSA titled Methods, Fields and Archives. And while I will talk about these as distinct and draw out some of their particularities, and in many ways they are distinct, as you will see they are also related in very particular ways. So this presentation will reflect on some of the underpinnings to them that begin with the premise that decolonization is not a metaphor, with reference to Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yang's 2012 paper of the same name. Instead, it is and should be profoundly unsettling. These curricula act to disrupt and actively unsettle categorizations of the architectural canon through multiple forms and modes of engagement. They question where we find architectural knowledge and what we understand as architectural truths, along with the structures, systems, and institutional underpinnings which produce and reproduce these knowledge systems. In reflecting on these curricula and the entangled worlds they speak to, these courses talk to the centrality of displacement and associated spaces of refuge. They point to a recognition and productive engagement with entanglements and multiplicities. An understanding of race making and space making as foundational to modernity more generally and intimately present within architecture, whether spoken or not. And third, a conscious and ongoing questioning of the boundaries between methods, fields, and archives, asking what it means to talk of these from the margins in particular. When I refer to the concept of displacement and refuge, I talk both to the actual material that in these courses we look at, discuss, and read together, in the ones I've taught, and to the wider context of displacing the process of curriculum development from an individual and internal process to a form of workshop, public engagement, exhibition, conference, and conversation. From academia to activism, from the seminar room to the street, quite literally in some cases and to the associated construction of a space of refuge, of a space to have safe conversations, sometimes difficult, a space of shelter for questioning the canon, with a full understanding and recognition that neither shelter nor refuge are metaphors. Okay. So the first course, Entangled Architectures. From 2017 to 2019 in the UK academic calendar, I was teaching a seminar series at the Bartlett titled Entangled Spaces. This is an elective six-week course, seminar course, followed by an independent research project developed by final year undergraduate architecture students. And it runs from September to March, roughly. The general thematic for the course emerged out of my own PhD research, which I completed at 2018 at the Bartlett, and which looked at a series of migrant markets, Pan-African markets in Cape Town, as spaces of refuge. These are markets established and run by, run and maintained by migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees in post-apartheid South Africa. In the context of an ongoing racialization of space and racialized politics of urban citizenship. 
The emphasis in my thesis was placed on the everyday marginal and subaltern as central. And through the course of my research, it became increasingly evident that despite these being localized and imbricated in located spatial politics, these markets were also intimately connected to places elsewhere. In the case of one set of markets known as Somali malls, notably Nairobi and Minneapolis. And while my PhD focused on South Africa and Cape Town, um, in particular, these markets spoke to wider and longer matrilineal networks of crossing borders, negotiating citizenships, and multiple engagements with nationalism. Post-PhD research took me to some of these related sites, and I show two photographs here. The similarity and closeness of these, despite the vastly different geographies, was striking. These entangled and transnational spaces began to open up the possibility for a critique, a shifting of views and conceptual frameworks for looking, producing an alternative kind of discourse. Certainly in the context of, I would say, a place like South Africa, but I think more generally, where developmental frameworks for looking at the global south dominate, and where informality is largely understood as often only small scale, localized, and survivalist within a needs-based discourse. My research questions these dichotomies between the global south and north, the epistemic framings of area studies, and how these frameworks operate as dominant ways of seeing, among others. My PhD adopted a multi-scalar approach to looking at these markets, from that of transnational and global displacements to the intimate scale of the small spaces within particular shops. And I argued that these shopping arcades as a whole and the small shops within are central to constituting an alternative sense of home in the context of forced displacement. They offer a kind of home place that exists at the ambivalent border between processes of homemaking and unmaking. And following bell hooks, suggests point to the margins and marginal as a site of radical potential. As Gloria Becker suggests, the concept of the cultural archive is intimately related to imperial history and deeply imbricated with the racial construction of the world. Therefore, in looking to architecture with a capital A as object, whether in as only object, we should say, whether in pedagogy, colonial, or post-colonial archive, Europe, Europe remains at the center, and how could it not? My PhD research deliberately looks beyond the architectural archive to question the categorizations and assume definitions of spatial typologies often taken for granted. Working across scales and across sites, talking to an entanglement of these markets, of stories that circulate, of goods that travel similar paths, and of people who facilitate and enable these movements. So to be very clear, my research does not suggest that these markets form a particular spatial type as related to ethnic or cultural identities. Rather, I suggest it points to broader socio-political factors that influence these spaces, along with the recognition that many are not formed out of choice. That they, are rendered, that they are often rendered informal, taking on Ananya Roy's critique of informality. And I suggest that the spatial organization is therefore as much about particular spatial practices which influence them as it is about their status as of the populations who inhabit these as migrant or refugee groups, having been displaced and their associated subordinate or marginal position within their urban contexts. <laughs> My research simultaneously both claims and rejects the category of architecture. So while I did not teach my PhD, my research and theoretical approach fit into the seminar series uh, at the Bartlett. And in the first year of running this course, it focused on migration, refuge, and displacement with the forced migrant as the central subject. In the second year, in the, um, what I'm going to talk about, entanglement was the starting point. Entang we understood entanglement as a condition of being entwined or twisted together, speaking of a spatial intimacy across vast geographies. In thinking with Edouard Glissant, entanglement talks to a sim simultaneous recognition that while some mobility is a choice, at other times the ensnaring and overlapping of worlds might be resisted, resistant, ignored, uninvited, and unchosen. 
where these boundaries are changing, ambiguous, and often unclear. For the first seminar on arriving and departing, we read Glissant and Hannah Arendt. Glissant's open boat set the tone for recognition of multiplicities as a site of extreme violence and degradation, but also open-ended possibility, and the potential for a radical remaking. As Saidiya Hartman's reading of the Caribbean suggests, with a gendered reading, along with a gendered reading of the belly of the world. Keeping these multiple framings in hand at the same time, with a marginal figure framed our initial conversation and entry into the seminar series. Edward Said reminded us in, liter in relation to literature that to read Jane Austen without also reading Frantz Fanon and Amilcar Cabral is to dissociate modern culture from its engagements and attachments. Each of the following seminar series takes as a starting point a distinct scale and seemingly spatial, stable spatial typology, along with different visual forms and media in the form of drawings, graphic novels, literature, photography, and film. And for me, this is really key to thinking about this course as an architectural course in looking at cultural production rather than assuming they don't exist. Each session was deliberately multidisciplinary and brought together different geographies where the conversations aimed at using these contrasts as a productive difference to actively disrupt, unsettle, and challenge ourselves, to question how our own spatial thinking is informed by multiplicities of displacements, of people, places, ideas, and temporalities. So we read together Arendt, Glissant, Sarah Ahmed, and Mary Douglas, Bell Hooks, Karen Berman, among others. We looked at apartheid South Africa, the development, of, the development of Buenos Aires as a white city, 1920s Japan, 1950s Japanese internment camps in California, and that's what we see here. Lagos, Jordan, London, Cairo, and Hong Kong. And importantly, while we were covering these different geographies, we were not looking at these as abstractions, but in details for their specificity. In the process of these four-hour seminars, we had critical conversations on area studies, transnational architectural networks, everyday architectures, ethics and design, power relations embedded within space, and the archive and informality as both a tactic and a tool. There were no distinct weeks on race and gender. Instead, they were brought into the wider discussions, yet race was centered with the basis of understanding that coloniality and modernity are co-produced and reproduced through hierarchies of gendered racial capitalism. We had some difficult, sometimes uncomfortable, and often confrontational discussions. The students challenged each other, and in choosing and yet, perhaps, uh, in choosing their own dissertation topics, all of the students took on this conceptual framework, and it's perhaps worth noting that they don't have to. Using the concept of entangled spaces in temporal, spatial, and geographic terms. And I very briefly want to introduce four examples of student work as examples um, from, from yeah, last year. These were excellent works, and there were many others. So two of the students in the group looked at homemaking practices through the figure of the Filipino domestic migrant worker, both coming to the topic from personal experiences, the one having grown up in a Filipino migrant home in the UK, and the second having been, having been cared for and essentially brought up by a Filipino domestic worker in Hong Kong, and both coming to this topic via Bell Hooks, Sarah Ahmed, and Mary Douglas. Patricia Castello, um, whose work I'm um, showing here, started with the concept of the Bayani, understood as a person of extraordinary courage, talent, who did something noble. Her dissertation explored how the modern Bayani is the often the female migrant laborer, tied into global networks of racialized migrant labor. Her work drew out homemaking practices for Filipinos in the UK, and the manner in which these two spaces Philippines and the UK are inhabited concurrently as here and there through a particular geographic imagination, material practices of home shrines, remittance houses, community gatherings, films, and food practices. 
Emily Mack, a second student, also started with an autobiographical interest. She looked into the homemaking practices of the large Filipino domestic migrant labor population in Hong Kong, having grown up in a home where she was largely cared for by a series of Filipino nannies. She came to the topic through the seminar series and reflecting on her experience of growing up in this context, and as she said, having never really thought about this person. Her research was structured around a series of temporal frames, each beginning with an autobiographical part fictional narrative as a way of confronting her own positionality. This sat alongside interviews, conversations, drawings, and a study of the legal frameworks in Hong Kong that construct a particular kind of gendered, racialized, and ethnicized domesticity, both within apartments and in the way public space is inhabited in the city. Um, Jed Ribas Goody wrote her dissertation as both an account of research on trans infrastructures of care in Berlin for migrants and as a handbook exploring this particular method for studying trans practices of home and away, drawing on Sarah Ahmed's writings, queer phenomenology, and the idea of the body as home and home as body, as leaky intersectional spaces. This came, came across in both the writing and in the multiple registers and through a practice of overwriting in the dissertation that spoke to the concept of entanglement through actively questioning the practice of research and what it means to design research methods for difference. And unfortunately, these images don't do justice to the care and craft put into the making of this product. And um, Jed went on to develop an activist practice and series of public dialogues on questions of curricular change at UCL last year and I think now elsewhere. Um, and the last uh, project I'll very briefly talk about is Joshua Richardson's, who looked into the racialized representation of informality in film, focusing on Blade Runner. This dissertation moved from the film screen as a site which reproduces, reinforces, and constructs an association of informality with particular materialities of corrugated iron and plastic and a racialized and gendered body. To the city of Los Angeles itself and the historic construction of the Asian as other, through Little Tokyo in particular. In developing the research project, the conclusion was part written and part filmic. Um, a filmic exploration of a primarily Caribbean street market in London as a way of talking to how film as a medium could be used in alternative and possibly complementary ways. There were many others. These were all experimental and creative, and all of these challenged the typical format of a history and theory dissertation through drawing, filmmaking, and the inclusion of fictional narrative, among other techniques. These are in, indeed examples of practice. They engaged with and questioned the architectural archive, spatial typology, and assumed dichotomies. They were located in reflective pieces that spoke to the positionality of their author and the specificity of the context they were researching, working against what Saidiya Hartman refers to as the violence of abstraction. Um, okay. So central to this course was that architecture as a discipline is not only the site of particular buildings designed by famous architects, but rather constituted of a wider landscape, landscape, including drawing, writing, filmic and urban cultures, both produced by architects as well as other cultural produ producers. And beyond the Another initiative that kind of happened at the same time beyond the actual seminar is so I was concurrently an organizer for, involved in organizing an exhibition and conference with Irit Katz and Giovanna Astolfo and Ella Gok titled Infrastructures of Care, which opened at the Bartlett on the 1st of February, so about a year ago. And this event in many ways mirrored some of the conversations we were having in the classroom in a different format. It was an event which brought together academics, activists, NGO workers, spatial practitioners, and students on questions related to infrastructures of care related to forced migration. Among other issues, the exhibition in particular questioned the ethics of aesthetics, how to talk about forced displacement without violating and dehumanizing the bodies of those displaced without aestheticizing something that is not aesthetic. 
The exhibition was curated on what participants brought to the table, close, careful readings, deep engagements, collaborative works, and an understanding of infrastructure as physical, social, human, and intellectual. Um, and I mentioned these projects together because in many ways the conversations were, where well, they were happening at the same time. Um, and, yeah. okay. The second project that I will talk to is moving towards an open access curriculum on race, space, and architecture. From October 2018 to April 2019, I was working with Suzanne Hall, co-director of the Cities program at the London School of Economics, on developing a curriculum focused on race, space, and architecture. This curriculum emerged out of a series of longer conversations and readings our work initially focused on racialized migration, a topic central to both of our individual research interests. And we began the year by a revisiting of the black radical tradition, post-colonial and decolonial theory, rereading Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, Edward Glissant, Sadia Hartman, Catherine McKittrick, and others. Along with newer writings, notably Gargi Bhattacharya's Rethinking Racial Capitalism and Brenna Bandar's Colonial Lives of Property, among others. Beyond the readings, our conversations engaged with the wider political economy of higher education and epistemic violence and injustices embedded in reading lists, courses, access, access to tenure and permanent jobs with questions of how institutions reproduce particular values, of who gets cited, who and what is considered legitimate or not. And this led to our decision to ask what a curriculum on race, space, and architecture would look like with architecture and the designed world as a key reference point, to question how these how a curriculum such as this might begin to unsettle the coloniality of race, violence, and place. Beyond our initial informal conversations or conversations among um, us, this curriculum was informed by more formal and other informal conversations. We followed a course on critical race theory led by Sarah Salem at the LSE. We met with smaller groups of urbanists, architects, critical race theorists, and geographers from around London, and we organized two public platforms. The first, a workshop where we presented an initial draft of the curriculum, alongside Tandy Lowenson from Breakline, um, who brought in specific questions related to race, her own design research, and the Bartlett as an institutional space. And the second focused primarily on London with various groups of artists and academics. These were central to our thinking process and a reminder that the implications of race making and space making, racial ordering and displacement are widely felt, lived in and resisted both within and beyond the academy. And it was not a suggestion that all scholarship should be public, but rather an assertion and recognition that certain publics are often excluded from scholarly spaces, institutions and debates. The curriculum engages with three key questions. What are the spatial contours of capitalism that produce racial hierarchies and injustice? What are the inventive repertoires of refusal, resistance, and remaking that, that are neither reduced to nor exhausted by racial capitalism? And how are they spatialized? And how is race configured differently across space? How can a more expansive understanding of entangled world space broaden our imagination for teaching and learning? The curriculum is conceptually framed around six spatial processes of racial ordering that are both spatial and material, with the understanding that race is constructed in and through architecture, through spatial processes of production and reproduction that extend beyond the object. So, okay. So these are the six processes, centralizing, circulating, domesticating, extracting, immobilizing, and incarcerating. Within each, this is one example, centralizing. So as an example, within each frame, we collect a range of references in the form of images, drawings, and text. Some of these sources and inspirations come from the discipline of architecture. Many do not. This is an important part of unsettling the disciplinary conventions of what architecture is, how it can be taught, and how architecture's on-the-ground impacts and future possibilities can be understood. 
Each section also includes links to related projects, activist groups, and different ways of imagining human connection and disconnection, a collage of reference points drawn from different geographies. The inclusion of visual, graphic, filmic material was central to how these processes are understood and represented. For us, this is an explicit drawing out of the materials that we use to talk about and think through and think with in design disciplines. This curriculum recognizes a lineage of racialized hier hierarchies endemic to capitalist systems and cultural life that extend from coloni colonialism to coloniality slavery to incarceration, liberalism to subordination, and sovereignty to populism. It's important to note that we recognize that while race operates at the level of the subject, it is also decisively operating at the level of structures, which define the raced body as constitutively outside, following Christina Sharp. And we recognize, following Brenna Bandar, that the colonial encounter produced a racial regime of ownership that persists into the present, creating a conceptual apparatus in which private property ownership globally remains bound to a concept of the human that is thoroughly racial in its makeup. And that these laws of property associated language, ways of seeing, and modes of subjectivity render indigenized and colonized populations as outside of history. As Bhattacharya suggests, bringing in the analysis of race to the conversation of capitalism points to practices of expropriation beyond and in addition, and in addition to exploitation, where expropriation involves accumulation and the relegation of groups as age populations of particular groups, race groups. So we question both the subject of race and the subject of architecture, how individuals are rendered as laborer, domestic worker, or immigrant in legal and cultural terms, and how the architectures of the camp, compound, detention center, solidify the gendered, symbolic, and lived forms of these positions. Yet importantly, we also recognize that within, around, and beyond the structures of racial capital is the substance of transgression. We look to places of solidarity for social justice are galvanized through space in the convening powers of the margins and in the arrangement of material and practices that together stake a location from which to speak. The places from which different circuits of connection, processes of validation, and alternative ways of inhabiting the world are established. And I'm thinking in particular of two texts that are included in this curriculum of Nadia Ellis's writing on dance hall and bounce in two post-plantation societies in New Orleans and Kingston uh, in the section circulating, along with Habiba Badrun's archival excavations on slave kitchens and cooks known for black magic or ghoul in 17th century Cape Town. These are two examples which talk about particular spatial typologies and places along with how they operate, are inhabited and embodied, drawing on archival indexing and research from fields including music studies, literature, slave records, community cookbooks, and sometimes architecture, historical material often understood beyond the limits of architecture and its constitutions of history. Catherine McKittrick draws out the paradoxes of race in relation to modernity as, raced, as the race subject being simultaneously central, unspoken, fully present, and disavowed. Instead, she posits a recognition of the difficult entanglements and violent intimacies, and a, and a reminder that the brutalities of racial violence are not descriptively rehearsed, but always already demand practical activities of resistance and encounter and anti-colonial thinking. So in thinking about the political economy of higher education, it was very important to us that this uh, curriculum is open access, recognizing that access to books, articles, and journals is often limited by paywalls. And in June 2019, we completed the first phase, which is downloadable, so you can download this document. And I'm very excited to be working further with both uh, Tandy Lowenson and Susie Hall on the next phase, expanding and building this across institutions. Okay, so the final uh, course that I will talk about is the most recent. In April 2019, um, 
I took on a position at the Graduate School of Architecture, University of Johannesburg, as the convener of history and theory. And the GSA is committed to the project of transformative pedagogies established by Professor Leslie Locko, a previous speaker on this very same lecture series. The school was started the year of the roads must fall, fees must fall protests. And in the past few years, student design work has responded to a call for alternative spatial imaginaries, which reverberate across scales, from the intimate present to the urban, national, continental, and planetary. Yet, while the GSA has certainly made its mark in terms of design teaching and design research in South Africa and from South Africa, history and theory has been a difficult terrain to, neg to negotiate for many for many of the reasons previously mentioned. Much of the existing research on modern and post-independence architecture on the African continent focuses on the role of the expat or settler colonial architect, yet very rarely do we hear what in particular Africa had to offer. Beyond, at times, ornaments applied and some vague traditional references, which may or may not have been African in the first place, or an essentializing and reductive approach that often epistemologically mirrors colonial frameworks. In taking on the role of setting up this history and theory program, important to me and to the school, was to extend the ways of thinking through architectural knowledge production that enable a critical reading of discourses, a depth of engagement, and a speculative approach to crafting and writing both the past and the future. So here I also have a set of three questions. The first of two courses that I've been developing is titled Methods, Fields, and Archives. It's both an introduction to histories and theories of architectural methodologies and questions and develops a critique on how we can read architecture. Key themes include race, gender, migration, and the de- or post-colonial imaginary. And it starts with these kind of three key questions. So what does it mean to engage with the transformative pedagogy in relation to the history, theory, and criticism of architecture? How do we talk about worldly, global, and cross-cultural architectural knowledge without essentializing, exoticizing, and orientalizing the other or ourselves? And particularly important for me in the South African context and in a design school, is to question how we talk about the politics of architecture and knowledge production without reducing architecture to politics. The course consists of five thematic seminars, each focused on a particular medium or method of architectural knowledge, which I loosely refer to as texts. These extend from more conventional architectural history and theory articles to manifestos, fiction, film, exhibitions, and oral histories. Across time, and across geographies. Each of the five seminars draws on a range of material, designed, crafted, and spatial, yet not necessarily canonical, and not necessarily from the architectural discipline, yet I would suggest distinctly architectural. Students interact with these materials through close readings and associated tasks, along with a research essay, all of which ask them to engage with the medium directly, to experiment, and in, to understand the essay as a process of working through, working out, and thinking through. So these are some of the examples of, this, of the weekly tasks that the student do, students do, which forms a kind of history and theory portfolio, and which sits alongside their research essay. The students took on the challenge. Each of these is themed depending on what we look at. So this one refers to the week looking at ethnography. The students took on the challenge, responding with evocative and thoughtful provocations. They took on the invitation to think collaboratively, responding visu both visually and through writing, with a resultant portfolio that created a space that enabled the expression of different strengths and voices. And I've included just a few samples of student work, which was attendant to the violences of history, along with moments of transgression, protest, and possibility, in and through fields such as ethnography, anthropological material, craft, film, political manifestos. So this is one of the manifestos written by a student, Gloria Pavita, um, and fiction. 
Hmm. We started this course with the premise that there are histories of architecture beyond the can canonical and that they do speak. Our task is to question how, where, when, and what this might mean for an architectural culture of knowledge production that speaks from our location, but not only to our location. This is a collaborative mapping that the students did in uh, November 2019 of their own work as a, as a group, which they turned into a zine. This current history and theory course has its own set of entanglements and ways forward. A GSA reading group, which takes on feminist, queer, and decolonial theory, open to all, with reading sessions led by two tutors and students. And we use this initiative to build a collective bibliography and create a space for open-ended conversations. Working and thinking through together and creating a space or um, claiming a space, really, to sit in the room with history, following sharp, and a series of conversation rooms started in 2019 um, through what was the previously the history and theory colloquium. So, okay. So, to draw this to a conclusion, these three st strands of courses, which I've been working on over the last year and a half form part of an ongoing project to question architectural knowledge production and the canon of the architect, architecture, architectural. Through the framework of entanglement, a recognition of racial capitalism, and a rethinking of methods, fields, and archives, and their attendant epistemic underpinnings. At the very core of all of these is that the cons these constitutions of race, gender, coloniality, as they are produced and reproduced in knowledge, are not arbitrary or incidental, but are in fact produced and reproduced in institutions. So indeed it was the theme of the institutional imaginary which we took on for the colloquium and which is currently framing how we are taking forward this question at the GSA. And I say we, as while I'm running the history and theory program, this is an intensely, intensely collaborative endeavor, which would not be possible without the community of students, design teaching staff, interested, interested practitioners, and colleagues and friends, both locally and globally, many of whom are here today. Sarah Ahmed reminds us that while institutions have become associated with an established order and assume stability, what is often overlooked is the instituting aspect of that which is instituted. She asks us to think of institutions as both verbs and nouns, to recognize the processes, labor, and work which goes into institutionality, to attend to how institutional realities become given, without assuming what is given by this given. They are collective endeavors involving all of those who do the work to establish, maintain, and actively produce the physical and intellectual space on a daily basis. So in the place of the annual, uh, what would have been a history and theory colloquium this past year, together with colleagues from Counterspace, um, Smea Valley, who's here today, and Sarah de Villiers, and in conversation with Breakline, David Roberts, Tandy Lowenson, and Miranda Critchley, we used the platform as a way of focusing on the theme of institutional imaginaries, questioning the central role institutions play in the formation of architecture, the university being just one of these. So as I started, I will end with a series of questions that we, some of what we've been talking about. Questioning the methods, means, and media we can use to become undisciplined architects. How positioning ourselves at the edge or margin might offer alternative insights into architecture, streets, cities, and planets. And asking what kind of institutional imaginary enables designing speculative wor worlds, drawing on the past for a different future. While in the global north, institutions are often critiqued as being resistant to change, in the South, they tend to be discussed in relation to their betrayals and failures. So we took on this vulnerability to suggest that it may offer us the possibility to think differently in the wake of this fragility. To raise the question of architectural knowledge production through multiple forms of engagement across institutional framings and across institutional politics, 
and through a choreography of the event space. Following Ahmed again, places are shaped by the proximity of some bodies and not others. This colloquium event, conversation space, attempted to actively question and disrupt relationalities. And while recognizing the danger of domesticating decolonization, I'd like to end by returning to McKittrick to recognize that thinking otherwise demands attending to a whole new system of knowledge wherein the brutalities of racial violence are not descriptively rehearsed, but always already demand practical activities of resistance, encounter, and anti-colonial thinking. Thank you. That was a really incredible talk that um, I said, I mean, I said before the lecture that I think um, this talk not only fulfills the brief of what we set out to do in the series, but it goes a really long way into making what we want to happen a reality. I think um, just seeing examples of student work responding to um, your, the different courses that you've run, but also to the curriculum as a whole is really exciting. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm quite curious to hear more about phase two of the curriculum that you guys are developing together with Suzanne yeah. and Tandy. Yes. I don't know how much you're uh, allowed to say about that. But. Well, I think, yeah. <laughs> We're meeting on Monday, so let's. <laughs> I think one of the, well, one of the key questions we're really keen to I think take forward, if I yeah, speak for us, is um, so firstly to actually make this open access. So we're building a website and trying to collect as many um, pre-publication versions of papers, and we've had amazing responses so far. People have been incredibly generous and um, in, and yeah really great responses to the curriculum and the project. Um, so that's, I think, that's really important for us. And part of this is also thinking forward into building on this as a platform. Um, and I think thinking about questions of what it means to think specifically about kind of speculative and alternative futures and how that relates to design projects or design thinking. So, yeah. Um, I just wanted to open it up to questions. If anyone has a question, just let me know. I'll bring the microphone to you. Like, okay, this is a lot for me, but <laughs> uh, one thing I was always wondering is like, how do you this? This is incredibly amazing to see as a person that has felt marginalized institutionally, but I've always wondered how do you get people who, who aggressively don't want to think about race to engage with stuff? Because honestly, right, speaking to me, it's like fine, like I agree with you and we're all very happy to do this, but that's not really, I, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question, and that's actually something I was talking to Manisha about just before this um, talk. And I think, I mean, I think it's a difficulty, uh, but one of the ways that I've been, one of the ways that I try to do it is to talk through the kinds of specificities of the contexts or places or things that I'm talking about. And part of that is also showing things like student work. Um, so I've had, I, well, so what I was telling, what I was talking to Manisha about just before this talk is um, I was just in Manchester and one of the comments that I got repeatedly was, well, we understand why, I'm kind of paraphrasing it, we understand why you might talk about race in your context, but what does this have to do with us? Which, well, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and, and I think that that's, so I think that that's a reality that you know we yeah we're facing, um, and I think one of the and one of the reasons that I started by talking about the the 
uh, course that I taught at the Bartlett is in a way to kind of frame how these conversations are talked about or can be talked about or are engaged with and um, by various students across geographies. So it's not just a question for South Africa or the American South, or um, but it's something that can be that can be discussed in the centre of London. Uh, and I think yeah, that's that's kind of one of the responses. It may be a follow-up question. Is like um, I was. I found it really interesting that you've had certain initiatives in the UK and in initiatives in South Africa. So, like, I am assuming that people are a bit more on the same page in South Africa. Does the does do you feel, what's your experience dealing with institutions like from here in, in South Africa? Um, that's that's a huge question. I think the so. So the challenges are different and the questions are different and the questions of how race is, and then this is also something that I think we're thinking about in, in de further developing it, because being really attuned to the specificities, specificities of the context and the kinds of questions that arise. Um, but I think that the question of race and architecture in particular, or even the way that institutions function to marginalize racialized bodies, is while they take on different forms in these different contexts, there are surprising uh, similarities across these contexts. And that's been one of the amazing things about working with, with these colleagues in London and working across the context, is I think a kind of awareness and thinking about um, what I what I think of as a kind of global economy of higher education, where even though we're positioned in very different ways with very different daily realities, sometimes the kinds of issues are not that dissimilar. And yeah. thanks so much for sharing this um, really thought-provoking body of, uh, of experiences and the work you've developed over the past three years. Um, I guess my question follows from the first question that was asked. Um, could we potentially relate that to the question of the canon, which I guess is also in the title of the series, um, which is New Can Canonical Histories, right? Um, and I'm wondering how you, I mean, that kind of began to come across in the, in the third body of work you kind of uh, introduced. Um, how does one approach the canon? Uh, through this kind of work, and not so much to identify or define it, but really, how does one cope with it, or does one actually uh, do that? And I'm particularly asking this because um, in the wonderful, rich uh, kind of uh, body of sources that you talked about, we didn't hear much uh, from among what's considered architectural history and theory. And I know that that's there, and this is not a criticism, I'm just wondering, because uh, that's a problem that I'm facing as well in my own work, actually. Um, and the question, of course, is, um, as you and I kind of, I guess, sort of encountered when we worked together in the uh, running the first uh, year history and theory, right? Uh, you know, it, it's maybe you know, one would kind of come up and say, oh, it's something else to do this on graduate level. Uh, but, uh, you know, will students, first year students want to, you know, read, you know, Le Corbusier, et cetera, right? So how do you actually kind of approach this, this problem, really, of, of the canon through this work? Okay. So I think, okay, so I guess it's there's sort of multiple ways of kind of, I think, talking about responding to it. My position is that the canon and the idea of, for example, the first year survey course or the survey course to architecture is deeply prob problematic for multiple reasons. And it's problematic because it assumes, and I think most of us probably know this, so we know these, these problems. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that I would say, and this is something that also came up in the debate I was part of yesterday, is that for me, one of the main reasons I find it so problematic is it's actually, is the kind of ahistoricity of it. So it's ahistorical. So it presents a particular version of history of an architectural tradition as though it is truth without really reflecting or engaging with other kinds of issues of, and debates. And I think when we look at other kinds of humanities disciplines, that first-year students are 
are encouraged to are required to engage with critical theory. So why, so for me, you know, the question is, you know, why should architecture students not when other students can? And what's the fundamental difference? And I think, so I think for me that the, this is more a question of how do we think about history and what is the kind of knowledge within history that we're trying to, that we want students to get out of this rather than a kind of um, selective, very selective, very specific kind of uh, instances of history that are put together into this kind of packaged history as history of architecture. And I would, and then I would say the other part of it is that I think this course that we that we put together, and I, go, I went back to this page, um, because I actually want to draw attention to the very specific kinds of spatial typologies that we're looking at here, and that we that I think we do draw out in this course. So we don't we don't. I don't think we frame it as directly challenging the canon or as a new canonical approach, but I actually do think that there are ways of, in, of talking about um, race and architecture that talk about these kinds of spaces. So each of these categories has a set of kind, of spa very specific spaces that we're talking about, whether they are the railways or markets or borders or music halls um, or the suburban house or the hostel or the ghetto. But what it does is it asks it asks the reader or the student or engager to engage with this and to think of these not as these isolated examples designed by an architect and not situated in a wider history, but rather to think of the kinds of the ways that it is situated in a bigger socio-political history, but still, it's still architecture. I mean, yeah. Just kind of following on what you were saying earlier, um, from South, I'm from South Africa and I'm just interested to know, similar to what you were asking, how is it different lecturing in a, with students who are dealing with raw racial issues in South Africa? Is it as raw here or like how, how what's your, been your experience of your students and how they respond to what you are talking through? So in both in teaching in London and in South Africa, I've had incredible responses from students. And I think some of the work that I discussed kind of it's testament yeah, to that absolutely. Um, and the way students respond. I think so some of the particular questions are quite different or how they're engaged with. And what is maybe what is, I think, particularly notable um, in South Africa is that in many ways the kinds of the way that architectural history is being taught so the, is actually still very canonical if I can use that in South Africa in contrast to um, a place like London where you actually do see a lot more diversity in what is considered architecture and ways of engaging with architecture and that has meant I think that for students, uh, I mean, the, the GSA is an incredible space. We have this amazing body of students who are really, who choose to come there specifically for what it offers in terms of design teaching and are really hungry for ways of thinking differently. So there has been a kind of, um, yeah, enthusiasm and uh, adoption of this course that was really, uh, that I didn't expect, I didn't expect it, to, well, I didn't expect that the way it was sort of engaged with. And some of the work that I've shown you, I mean, the, some of it was like, for example, the, the mapping that they did, which was done um, after they submitted their design work in their holidays as a kind of, you know, working on this, uh, on this scene, on this publication out of their own choice, which I think, which was incredible to see that they took the time to do that and to put in their own energy and, yeah. That's great. Thanks. Thank you so much for a really wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to follow on from that thinking about the canon and ask a quick question about evidence, about archives, about mm -hmm. how you work with the historical evidence that's available to us. It was so striking, that Japanese internment camp image that you showed early on, how kind of cartoonishly depicted uh, the American government had chosen to lay out this you know, space of violence. And I wonder, 
you know, when so many of the evidence that might point us towards the actual experiences of the people who suffer racialized violence are lost or never existed in the first place, and then also when colonial governments destroy the evidence of their own mis misdoings at massive scale, how do you as a historian, as an architectural thinker, like position yourself in those flows of evidence and destruction and, and yeah, non-existence? Thank you. Um, thank you, that's a really good question. And, and probably, you know, part of the reason why this last course is called Methods, Fields and Archives. Um, so this is this is actually part of a work done by Mine Okubo, who was a Japanese, she was interned in a Japanese internment camp. Um, but it was published as part of an, a government published magazine while she was in the camp. So it's, quite, it's got this quite interesting history where it's, yeah, sort of dual history between um, how it's drawn and where it's published, but also that it talks about this other history and part of a bigger series of work that she did also post being in the camp. Um, I think I'm, I made this comment about suggesting that, so I think there, there are definitely ways of looking at archives um, that are not maybe, oh, well, let's, let me restart. I think that with, with history, whether an archive is fully formed or not, so whether we have a kind of complete archive, we have to recognize that the archive is always selective and it's always a kind of put together in a particular way. And so, on the, so it might at times be more difficult to find material. So for example, I talked a bit about Habiba, I mentioned very briefly Habiba Badrun's work on um, slave histories in Cape Town. And that's a kind of very difficult, the archival uh, evidence is really archival traces because of the particular histories and the kinds of uh, spaces. But I think as her work points to and at many others, that they aren't, it's not that there are no archives or it's, it's not that there is no evidence. It's a matter of where you look for it and how you look at it. And what Yvette Christiansa calls looking sideways in the archive. So sometimes the, the very absence of something or someone talks, tells us quite a lot about their position in space and time and history. Um, and, then some, and then sometimes it's things like, um, Habiba Badrun's work is really interesting because she looks at community cookbooks as a way of thinking about, and the kinds of stories that are told about producing food, which she describes as a kind of embodied practice, where stories of slave histories are told, handed down, they're oral histories, they have different kinds of, I think they exist within different kinds of knowledge frameworks, but these are still histories and these are still forms of evidence um, that, um, that enable someone like her to write a history of these slave kitchens. Um, so I think, I, I think it's much more useful to think not about the things that are missing, but to think about their presence and how we can find them across varied terrains or landscapes. Hi, well just um, thank you, Huda, um, that was wonderful. Um, what I just want to add is a, a bit of a commentary on questioning the canon by questioning the ways that um, you choose and you encourage your students to conduct the research. I'm specifically talking about drawings like this, which we don't usually see in, you know, history theory. I'm speaking from the point of view of a studio tutor that, you know, is used to students drawing and exploring kind of ideas via drawing, diagramming, but in history theory, it's not very common. And I know that features, and it did feature in your research, and that was kind of quite a deliberate decision, I guess. So maybe you can talk to us about that and, and the role it's playing in criticizing the way that history and theory has been taught and uh, researched. Um, yeah. um, okay, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I think, so images like this and various others and um, and I think even, you know, the way that we put together the race, space and architecture curriculum with this foregrounding of the visual, of visual material is, is for me really a way of, of 
of commenting and um, positioning architecture as a, as a discipline which so there is the stuff that we write about architecture and then there's the, the kinds of materials that architecture uses in its own production. And I think it's not necessarily about privileging one over the other, but it's recognizing that very often these forms of whether it's drawing or visualizing are also, are also part of architectural knowledge production. Um, and, and start, and, and reading those as a form of knowledge. Um, and with the course in Johannesburg, so the student responses being something that's both drawn and written is, is importantly about positioning that, um, positioning the course in relation to that. So not, not as this kind of really distinct thing, but as a, but as a field that does engage with these media. Uh, I, do, I do think that architectural history engages with drawings and images, um, but yeah, uh, it's not always, well, yeah, maybe it's not always kind of the primary thing or the object. Thanks. Hi, Huda. Um, thanks for, again, just to uh, also say thank you for such a terrific uh, presentation of materials. I want to build it directly on that last question. Um, you know, these slides and materials are so beautiful. Their design is, uh, you know, even the posters are uh, fantastic. So I guess maybe not looking back to, uh, you know, blueprints and architectural materials in the archive, but what about your own practice as uh, an artist, you know, and the aesthetic of uh, the materials that you're producing? I wonder, is that helping you to think in a certain way? You know, you're sort of drawing out of in the double double sense of that uh, of that word um, I think it is so I can't take credit for all of this work if it's not um, a lot of it's been done with other people and um, we have an amazing graphic designer at the GSA Fred Swart who helps with a lot of the work and um, this poster these posters for example were done with um, Simea who's sitting here and um, Sarah so um, so it is a kind of uh, but but I think but yes, it def definitely is part of what we're doing. So we are, so even in in this colloquium and maybe to talk specifically about it, it was something that I think, if I can speak for us, that I think we thought of as something that we are designing. So it was, it's not just about bringing a set of speakers together, it is about that. Um, and it is about how we bring people together and how we arrange it, but something that I think of that I definitely think of as a design in itself, as a um, from the event to the drawing out of the space to how we chose to inhabit particular parts of the space and um, move audiences from inside to outside or engage with the street. We had a street gallery, for example. Um, so the poster is definitely part of that and it is also, I think, part of how we understand Architecture is not necessarily the building, but in this kind of material um, that we enact. I guess I think that's a kind of nice moment to um, not end, but um, maybe just move to the next part of the evening, which is to have a more informal conversation over some drinks and canapes. Um, but please join me in thanking Huda for a really excellent lecture. Thank you.